This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming, and I am just so excited for this interview, I will be welcoming former actor, comedian, Miles Chapin. Miles was in so many classic movies back in the 70s and 80s, uh, it's insane. He was in Blessed the Beasts and Children, uh, the movie version of Hair, um, Buddy Buddy, Pandemonium, The Funny Farm, Get Crazy, and two cult classics that are celebrating milestone anniversaries, The Fun House, Toby Hooper classic horror movie. He was the nerd in that movie. And Howard the Duck celebrating his 35th anniversary. And it's going to be great having him on the show today. He got out of the business and got into, I believe it was, it's realty or something like that. I'm going to have to ask him um, when he comes on today. Um, there was very limited research on that. But it's going to be a great interview. It's a rare and exclusive interview. And I am so excited. I just have an amazing life during quarantine with the amazing people that I get to interview. So yeah, here is my interview with Miles Chapin. Hey, Miles. Hello there. How are you? I am great. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I had to take this uh, call from my office. That was why I asked the, uh, the, 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 the pushback in time. But um, I managed to get a little conference room to myself, so here we are. I hope the fidelity is okay. Oh, yes, it's perfect. This is a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. <laughs> So, going back in time, I, I know that your father was involved in opera, and that's how you got discovered, right? You were in the children's chorus of the New York City Opera? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Skitch Henderson was conducting a uh, street scene, and uh, he was, you know, a fan of the families, and there I was, a little rug rat running around, and they needed a chorus of rug rats for that opera, so yeah, he put me in there, and... I got scouted for Ladybug, Ladybug from that, and, uh, you know, and then I was like the funny fat kid for a couple of years, and, uh, <laughs> you know, there's always a funny fat kid in the movies, and that was me for a while, and lost the weight, and tried to reinvent the career, and, you know, did moderately well, and, you know, careers in showbiz are strange. They sure are. I <laughs> know I've learned that all the time in the last four years that I've been doing this podcast, how strange it is. Had you um, been doing any school plays before that? Um, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I went to a progressive school, and there were always, you know, school plays and such. Um, but I, I was always, I mean, I was working as a professional since I was eight years old, you know. So that was, that was a little bit different. But also, because my family were in the arts, mm -hmm. it was not like sort of being a professional child, you know? I mean, these days, you know, you go to an audition where there's children and there's, you know, lots of parents hawking their kids and pushing them around. My folks were not like that at all. They kind of tolerated this and they always asked me, do you want to do this? And I'd say, yeah, of course I want to do that. Who wouldn't want to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't the first thing in my life, you know? Um, it was always, you know, trying to be as normal as possible and then, oh, and by the way, I, I do movies or something like that. Right. It's funny. I mean, I went to I went to a boarding school and I got cast in uh, Bless the Beast and Children uh, at the end of my second year, and mm -hmm. uh, the school they really didn't understand it at all. So they basically said, "Well, you know, you can't come back. You're going to miss two months, and then you'd miss the semester. And if you're going to miss the semester, you should miss the whole year. And so you really ought to repeat the year." And it was just like, "What? What are you saying?" So uh, I, I finished high school at a professional school in New York, professional children's school. But the ironic thing, and why I mentioned this, is that mm -hmm. uh, two years later, they went and filmed a movie on the campus of that boarding school. So the whole campus went showbiz crazy and, you know, 
It was funny. You know, it was ironic that that happened two years after I left. Then they understood showbiz. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Ladybug, Ladybug was the first movie. You were, what, eight or nine? Yeah. 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 I was 1960, I think. I was born in 54. So, I mean, I, I forget the date. 62, maybe it was 62. Yeah. Yeah. What do you remember about uh, Frank Perry? Oh, I love Frank Perry. I, I kept up with him. Uh, he was a remarkable director. Um, no, he, um, it was funny, a couple of years later, many years later in Hollywood, I, I got together with him and we had a bunch of lunches and dinners and stuff and talked about projects. I mean, he was a, I mean, he and his wife, his then wife, I mean, that was, that was the birth of the American independent film movement. You know, there's an argument to be made for that. David Lisa, Ladybug, Ladybug, play it as she lay, as it lays. I mean, these are these are seminal movies in uh, you know right. America. They really are. And he's uh, uh, he's he's kind of going, undergoing a career renaissance now. I mean, he's no longer with us, of course, but yeah. a lot of people are reassessing his work. You know, uh, and it's it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Ritanya Alda told me when they were doing uh, Mummy Dearest, he really kept the fires from erupting because Faye Dunaway was so difficult on that movie, you know? Of course, of course, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Frank, I mean, the thing is, he, he kind of wanted the brass ring, you know? He really he really wanted to grab it, and uh, and maybe that wasn't in his in his karma, you know? Because it was, it was just funny. I mean, he had such a great career as an independent filmmaker and when he wanted to go Hollywood you know with Corsair pictures and all of that that was that was uh, you know it was just it was a different different scene for him you know I mean I remember having a talk with him once when he was running Corsair pictures you know because I was writing at that time and I, I remember saying to him Frank you know what, what kind of movies do you want to make you know and you think the answer is going to be oh I want to make comedies or I want to make you know really important films no his answer was well I want to make successful pictures that make a lot of money of course <laughs> Like I was a blittering idiot, and I thought, oh, okay, yeah, well, you, you and everybody else, you know, just go, go chase that. But um, no, he was he was wonderful. He was, I mean, he was also a great director on the set. He was he was uh, uh, great to work with. Mm -hmm. And it was also William Daniels' first movie. Do you remember anything about him? Was it his first movie? Yeah, wow. he had like a long um, theater career before that. Yeah. Well, no, William Daniels. I mean, he is one of the great American actors. I mean, you know, let's yeah. face it. You know, Broadway, the theater, in movies, The Graduate, 1776. I mean, please, this man has an incredibly distinguished career. Um, and, you know, he's, he's kind of a New Englander. He's, he's, you know, a little bit like that. I mean, and also in that movie, he was playing the principal, and, you know, we were the kids. And so there was this, you know, this, this uh, uh, distance maintained. Um, but also people like Nancy Marchand in that movie. She was a wonderful actor. You know, she was in The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. She was in that. Uh, 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 Jane Connell was in Ladybug, Ladybug. Alice Clayton was in Ladybug, Ladybug. You know, it's, it's a remarkable cast. Mm -hmm. It is a very good cast. Yeah, very underrated movie, too. So uh, when you did Bless the Beast and Children, I mean, that's a Stanley Kramer movie. That must have been an amazing experience. Of course, absolutely. Well, that was the one that I was at Phillips Exeter, yeah. and I got cast in that. And it was like they didn't understand that perhaps, you know, doing the leading role in a Stanley Kramer picture was an educational experience, <laughs> perhaps on a, some kind of an equivalent of, you know, a year at Phillips Exeter Academy. Um, but, yeah, no, that was amazing. Stanley was just a just a phenomenal, phenomenal guy. I mean, you know, he produces his own movie so he could basically do what he wanted to do. And, and you know, I keep up with the cast. Mumi and I are friends. Mark Mahaney and I are friends. Daryl Glazer and I are friends. You know, and I still, to this day, that movie really hit a nerve. There's a lot of people that, you know, just that movie was very, very important to them. Yeah, did you did you know Bill Mummy before then? No, I didn't know any of those guys before then. You know, I mean, we all got hired separately, and then Stanley put us together for well, two or three weeks before we started shooting in Arizona because, you know, he wanted us to get to know each other, and we all had to learn how to ride a horse. I, I'd never been on a horse in my life. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, we had to, you know, we had riding lessons, and it was great, and we were sort of bonded. So the, by the time we got to Prescott, Arizona, where we shot it, you know, we were, we were buddies, we were friends, and that camaraderie hopefully, you know, came across a little bit. 
Yeah, I used to see the movie all the time on HBO when I was a kid, and now it's, they don't play it at all anymore, which is sad. Well, it'll come around. You know, all <laughs> these things cycle in, cycle out, you know. Yeah. There's so many great actors in it, though. Bruce Glover, who I'm trying to get. Uh, Jesse White, I'm actually friends with his daughter, Carol. She's been on here several times. Interesting. You know, I worked with Bruce Glover's son. Crispin? And- Crispin, yeah. yeah, and and it was it was funny because I, I felt so old saying I worked with your father, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, you know. But he uh, he looked they looked just the same too, and Crispin was a great guy. I mean, he's very great, you know. So <laughs> yeah. funny, you know. You've been around long enough, you get to work with people's kids, you know. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so after you did To Find a Man, there was a long gap before you did Hair. Did you already start doing uh, stand-up at that point? You know, I never did stand-up. I mean, I, 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 I had that association because, I don't know, somebody you know, oh. got on the web somehow, and I did a movie where I played a stand-up, but I, I never did stand-up comedy. Oh, okay. so what happened was that uh, I got out of high school, and um, I, I wanted to be an actor. Uh, and so you know, I moved into a house in Brooklyn and got a job at a restaurant waiting tables and started doing TV commercials and started doing industrial films and started taking acting classes and working and working and working and then, you know, waited for the breaks. And there weren't a lot of young actors at that time. I mean, there weren't a lot of roles for young actors, but there just weren't a lot of young actors around. And then hung in there and hung in there. And then Hair came along, which is a very rigorous casting process. And, uh, And I did that. And then French Postcards came along. You know, so I did a small part in a big picture picture and then a, a, a big part and a small picture, which was heaven, which is exactly what I wanted to do. But, you know, none of them were, were, were hits, you know, and then yeah. I, I had a Hollywood agent and then I started going to L.A. quite a lot and going back and forth, you know, and, and I managed to work, but nothing was a big, huge hit. You know, that's what that's what everybody wants, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it, I mean, they're interesting pictures. I mean, it's, it's funny. I had a long conversation with Alan Arkush the other day who directed Get Crazy. Yeah. You know, and that's, an, that's another movie that's sort of coming back into its own. There, we, we did the commentary for a, a Blu-ray version, you know, and it's, 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 it's fun. It's a lot of fun. But, you know, life, life, life sends you a lot of things that you didn't, you didn't know was happening. You know, you can't take any of it too seriously. You know, you got to keep going. And I've always worked in the theater, you know, in between times when I, you know, didn't want to spend all my time in L.A. just trying to, you know, compete with every other actor in L.A. Yeah. I feel much more at home in New York. Uh, I'm from New York. And there's also, there's more more stimulus here. I mean, you, you go to a party and you're not going to meet a bunch of actors or yeah. studio people. I mean, here it's like there's finance, there's media, there's fashion, there's there's education, you know, there's any number of industries. And, and you know, I started writing too, so a lot of the publishing was here, so the, you know, the, the books and the magazines that I was writing for, that was mostly here. And I did a lot of regional theater too, you know, going to places like New Haven, Connecticut, to the Yale Rep, and down to Baltimore, Center Stage, Philadelphia Drama, Guild, you know, this is how you learn to be an actor. This is how you learn the skills. Right. You know, I mean, uh, that was the kind of actor I wanted to be. I mean, I wanted to be a highly skilled, um, highly respected character guy. You know, and mm-hmm. it's, it's funny because there's almost no room for that anymore. You know, it's, it's it's curious. I know. Oh my God. I mean, back in those days, I mean, you guys could be experimental and you know there was lots of room for error and stuff and you could you know get better at what you do now you have to just be already you know fully formed because you exactly. know, pe- people are afraid you know the audiences are going to walk out because they paid all that money yeah so the stakes are higher that's exactly it you know in a movie like french postcards i mean a studio mm-hmm. picture that's shot for like a two million dollar budget in a foreign country forget it yeah. You know, it's all tentpole stuff. You know, my, as much as I'd love to be in the Marvel Universe, they're not going to hire me. They're not going to hire somebody that has, you know, 100,000 followers on Instagram. I mean, it's just that's the way that game is played. Oh, they might hire you because you were in Howard the Duck. <laughs> <laughs> well, Howard the Duck is in some of those movies, but not me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I heard they're, they're, they've been trying to reboot the last few years. But... Um, 
Yeah. So hair. I mean, that must have that must have been a, a rigorous preparation. Uh, did you Did you uh, see the the original play when it was um, on Broadway? Yeah. Yeah. I did. I did. I'm, I'm I'm old enough that I went to see it on Broadway, not at the off Broadway at the Public Theater, but I saw it on Broadway, and that was an epoch making event in the theater, you know. And so the question when the movie came up was, is it too soon or too late for this movie? You know, is it is it is it close enough to the era do people going to think that this actually is a period picture or is this not now yeah. we don't have that problem now we know it's a period picture yeah. which it was at that time but it was only like 10 or 15 years removed from the original production and it was a little close for comfort so it kind of was a little confusing for a lot of people but that also was the chance that I had to work with Milos Forman for the first time which became one of the happiest you know collaborations and, and partnerships I had, you know, in anything I've ever done in my life. I mean, you know, to do three pictures with him was just phenomenal. And to come very close to, to, to being in a fourth picture with him, you know, mm -hmm. which was too bad that I didn't get that, but who knows, you know. Um, you know, and, and Hair was just, you know, I mean, my God, Twilight Star, but what a movie. What a movie. I think it's, I, I, I think very highly of Hair. I think it's one of the best if not the best movie musical since Singing in the Rain. I agree. And again, I'm an, interest, I'm an interested party, so. Uh, Beverly D'Angelo, she's so great at it, and that's what broke her through. Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. She's wonderful, yeah. The role you probably get recognized for the most is Richie in uh, The Fun House, right? Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean... I, I guess there's more fans for horror film out there. Yeah. So sometimes I go to the conventions, you know, and that's the thing that, that people kind of look at because that, that movie's got a kind of a cult following. Yeah. But it's, I mean, I've had the kind of career where somebody kind of looks at me and goes, wait a minute, I know you. Did we go to school? No, we didn't go to school. Do I, are you, what? Yeah, yeah, I was an actor. You were? What were you? Anything I would have seen? Yeah, things you would have seen. Well, tell me, no, please, please, you know, I, Here's my name. Go look it up, you know, because it's 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 I sort of have that kind of a face that it's unthreatening and you sort of become that guy. You know, it's like for a while. I mean, not so much anymore because I haven't done a movie in a number of years, but you just sort of people have this familiarity with you, you know, and it's, it's mm -hmm. funny. They think they know you from someplace. So uh, and I never know. I mean, if somebody comes up and actually does recognize me or they that they know me, it's always interesting to, to, to know from what. Because that's like really interesting, and we can talk about fun house, or we could talk about, you know, get crazy, or, or, you know, whatever the picture is that they bless the beast and children, you know. And I have fond memories of all of them, so it's, you know, it's that's that's the joy of it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, I was working with Toby Hooper. Oh, Toby was a gas. I love Toby. What yeah. not to love? I mean, he was a wonderful Texas maniac, and he was just. Uh, having a ball there you know i mean he's uh, uh i just uh, he was I, I really got along well with him you know and i i think also in that cast i um there were a couple of people like were hadn't had that much experience in movies mm -hmm. and so he would sort of you know look to me to kind of like you know he'd say okay kids you know in this scene you all kind of skitter in here like flies and then they do like spiders over here and kind of do this do that you know what i mean yeah. and then i sort of start laughing and Toby would say, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, you tell them. And then he'd walk away. You know? <laughs> he'd set up these huge shots on a crane or something, and I'd say, okay, guys, you know, <laughs> skitter around like spiders, just don't block each other, you know. It was very funny. Yeah, it, it's funny. The people who worked with him in his Hollywood uh, career have told me a lot of good things about him, but the people who worked with him on Texas Chainsaw Massacre tell me a completely different story. <laughs> I guess, well, you know, yeah. yeah. I guess he matured as time went on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think Funhouse might have been the pivot for him because that was, you know, that was a a studio picture that was pretending it wasn't a studio picture, you know. And uh, yeah. I mean, the tragedy with that movie was they filmed it backwards. They shot all the outside stuff first, and then the Funhouse stuff last. And by the time we got into the Funhouse, they were running out of money and the budget was going and it was, you know, so they didn't get to do, you know, Toby didn't get his vision of what he wanted inside yeah. that, that, that fun house, you know, and that's, that's the meat of the, of the, of the meal, you know, which was too bad because it uh, should have been the other way around, you know, but Hey, yeah. I didn't produce it. So 
Larry Block wrote a good script. Uh, I was supposed to interview him last Halloween, but uh, he got busy. Hopefully this year I'll get to talk to him. Uh, mm-hmm. were, were you satisfied with your death in the movie? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I got, I got to come back and die again, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, the only when you're going to get hanged in a movie, you've got to make sure that the special effects department shows you how the how the gag works before you strap yourself into it. Yeah. Um, because I I've Dangerous. had friends that have had you know terrible stories about you know well the cable's going to connect this the rope is just for show and then they they say okay show me you know they put sandbags on it and they hit the trap door and then the cable snaps and the sandbags are hanging from the rope and it's like. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> doing a pretend hanging is, is very risky, though, I'll tell you. Alice Cooper has been doing it on stage for years, and one time he almost did hang. He By the time he was done, he had these, you know, marks all, all over his neck, and he was bleeding this one night <laughs> that he was on stage. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very tricky. And also, of course, in the movies, you know, nobody wants to be unsafe, but the thing is you approach the area of being unsafe slowly enough that you don't see the line when you cross it you know and it's just like i mean it's like the tragedy with the twilight zone movie with the helicopter when vic morrow died i mean you can totally understand that it's like take one the director says okay it's good but make the explosion bigger and send in the chopper lower okay okay that's good take three. Oh, this is great okay now make it even bigger and send the chopper in even lower and who knows when you get to the point where the special effect is going to upset the chopper and it's going to crash and that's exactly what happened you know because yeah. you, you take little steps to get there you, nobody consciously goes into an unsafe environment you know so it's 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 hard you know you've got to calibrate constantly you know and if you're an example like you know, doing a night shoot and it's four o'clock in the morning and the sun's going to come up and it's cold and you have one more chance to get that shot, yeah. that's when people, you know, do things that in their right mind they perhaps wouldn't do. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's something I'm sure you probably thought nobody knew, but thanks to YouTube, I, I know this. Uh, you were in Jeff Altman's pilot, Bulba. I was. I had the leading role in Bulba. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was one of those one of those things. I loved that. I loved that script. I loved that show. I, I would have been very happy to do that for a number of years. Um, yeah, Jeff Altman was in that, and uh, it's funny. I just somebody talked about some pilot just the other day, and, and I looked it up, and it is available on YouTube. It's amazing. Jeff Altman and um, Galen Sartain yep. and um, Bill Hicks. They met him. Well, Gregory Itzen, who's become a very good friend of mine, was in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, Bill, uh, what's his name, the stand-up comedian, who Bill was Hicks. just, like, phenomenal. Bill Hicks. Bill Hicks, exactly. Yeah. I mean, just one of the great stand-ups. Yeah. My God, what the... work, you know. And Joyce Van Patten and Roger Bowen, who was in the movie MASH. I mean, come on. L- Lyle Wagoneer, who passed away last year. That's right. Yeah, he was great. He was great, yeah. And Armin Shimmerman, he's great. You know, I knew Armin from New York. Yeah. He and I worked at a, a theater in the Flower District in New York together, so I knew him. Yeah. But, you know, anytime you do a TV series, I mean, you're sort of like looking for, like, who's going to be the breakout character, right? Mm-hmm. Who's fond of Who's going to be the, the character that all of a sudden they're going to be a star? And then it's like you look around and you say, well, if this is a hit... Do I want to play this character for, you know, five, six, seven years? Do I want to work with these people for five, six, seven years? You know, it's it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It really is, you know. Yeah, it is. Yeah, especially in those days. I mean, if you were a, a TV star, the only movies you'd be able to get into were like B-movies, you know, because people thought that, you, that they weren't going to go see you if you were in a big mainstream movie. But then eventually that went away. You know, people were able to do both, like Michael J. Fox and Tom Selleck and Ted sure. Danson. Yeah. yeah. Well, actors, actors want to act, you know, and you go where the work is. You know, you take almost any actor and you go to IMDb and you see that for every movie they've done that is a prominent role, they've probably done four or five direct-to-video disc, you know, direct-to-cable, you know, things that you probably didn't know, you know, that's shot in Romania and available on VHS, you know, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. You got to be in Billy Wilder's last movie, Buddy Buddy. That wasn't his last movie. 
He did. He did uh, one or maybe two after that, but it was his last big studio picture for sure. Work, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, so many people don't like the movie, but I like it. I think it's hilarious. Uh, I need to see it again because I didn't like it. I haven't seen it for thirty years, but I remember just groaning through it. You know, just thinking, "Oh my god!" <laughs> but I need, I need to see it again. What was that intimidating to uh, work with uh, Mathau and Lemon? Huh? No, um, it was so professional. It was just on another level, another level altogether. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'll tell you a curious story. So I, I told you I went to this fancy English, uh, Eastern boarding school called Phillips Exeter Academy, right? right. So, uh, and I also, the, the, the grade school I went to in New York is a kind of a famous progressive school called the Dalton School. And when my mother, who went to the Dalton School, uh, when she heard I was going to work with Walter Matthau, she said, oh, I went to Dalton with his wife. Well, say hi, to tell hello. I said, okay, thanks a lot. So the mm -hmm. first day on the set, I was in makeup with Walter Matthau, and they, they introduced us, and, you know, he was sitting there doing a crossword puzzle, and I'm getting made up, and I didn't, other than saying a word, and then he called out, I need a four-letter word for, you know, whatever it was, and, and I don't do crosswords, but I, I happened to know that word, and I said, how about so-and-so? He looked at me, and he goes, who are you? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I introduced myself, and I'm playing Eddie the Bellhop, and he yeah. goes, oh. Like this, and I said, "Oh, and by the way, my mother says to say hello to your mother." <laughs> and he looked at me, and he said, "It was great. I love the leap." He looked at me, and he goes, "Did you go to Dalton too?" And I went, "Yes, I did." He goes, "Where else did you go to school?" And I said, "Well, I went to Phillips Exeter Academy, and you know." And he goes, "Oh, okay." And then he left, and then like. 45 minutes later, Jack Lemon comes up to me. He was a very friendly, outgoing guy. Yeah. And he said, Walter tells me that you went to Phillips Exeter. And I went, yeah, I, I did. He goes, well, I, I went to Andover. I, I'm a Phillips Andover boy. <laughs> and I said, no kidding. Rival school. That's great. And he said, oh, and I went, to, uh, I went to Harvard, too. Did you go to Harvard? And I said, no, I didn't go to Harvard. And I said, but my, my father, um, he works in Columbia. He's the dean of the School of the Arts at Columbia. And he goes, really fascinating, fascinating. And then he walked away. And then, like, an hour after that, Izzy Diamond, you know, I.A.L. Diamond, who co-wrote the script with Billy Wilder, he comes to me and he goes, I, I hear your father works at Columbia University. And I went, yes, that's true. He goes, I went to Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you don't expect those kind of connections to work on a Hollywood movie set. That's my point, you know. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're trying to join, you know, a club in New York or something or get into a fancy Fifth Avenue co-op, maybe people care what school you went to, but not on a, not in Culver City, you know. Yeah. It's just funny that way. <laughs> yeah, but back then, I mean, it was a much more smaller world, you know, smaller community. I've been finding out, you know, so many people, like, knew each other and so many people are connected to each other from that time. Oh, yeah, it's a, it is a very, very small world. But also, to get back to what it was like, it was, ex I mean, extremely professional. Yeah. I mean, at 5 o'clock, if you're in the middle of a scene, uh, you'd stop, and everybody would go home and have dinner and come back the next morning at 8 o'clock, and you'd pick up, you know, right where you left off, which was, which was weird. Um, in fact, at one time I was at a party in New York, and I was talking with a guy from the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, uh, you're, I hear you're an actor. And I went, yes, I'm an actor. And they said, oh, well, well, I was I was out in Hollywood last week. And I said, you were? That's interesting. What, what were you doing in Hollywood? And he said, uh, I was on the set of Billy Wilder's new movie. And I said, really? Fascinating. But what did you see on that set? And he said, well, it was really amazing because they were doing this scene where this, this young actor was like getting covered with hot water. I guess the scene was that this guy was trying to hang himself, Jack Lemon was hanging himself and the pipe breaks and this, yeah. you know, this guy who works in the hotel is trying to put it together and he was getting soaked over and over again and then they would they'd cut the cameras and then they'd dry him off and towel him off and then in the middle of it, they said, okay, we're going to stop for the day and this poor guy had to come in the next morning at 8 o'clock and do the same thing again. And I looked at him and I said, yes, I know, that was me. And he looked at me and he said, what are you, what are you talking about? I said, I'm that actor. I'm the one you watched on that set. <laughs> was, he was like, are you kidding me? And I said, 
no, I'm not kidding you. It's true. You know, so yeah. uh, it's funny. It's funny. <laughs> that is pretty funny, yeah. You're, you're my seventh guest from Pandemonium. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. Yeah. How was that? Did it live up to its name? <laughs> It wasn't that crazy, but like every every day, it's like, oh, who's going to be on the set today? Kay Ballard. Oh, Joe D'Alessandro. Pee Wee Herman. Tommy Smothers. You know, it's like <laughs> it was just it was a it was just the circus. I mean, it was just amazing uh, and a, a lot of fun, a lot of fun to do because we we got to, to add a lot of stuff. You know, we got to you know put in our own ideas and make up some dialogue and stuff and I, I like working that way I like when the director lets you do that and Alfred Soul was very open to ideas and again some extreme talents I mean Judge Reinhold you know forget about it he's brilliant oh, yeah. you know he's just Carol Kane my god you know and yeah. you know not to mention Paul Rubens Tom Smothers you know just just every every day was a new adventure it was great yeah Alex Elias I, I adore her oh yeah yeah, yeah. Then uh, you did a Canadian comedy for Roger Corman's New World, uh, The Funny Farm. I, well, I don't think we did it for, for... We did it for a Canadian company that then was absorbed by New World. I mean, there was a lot of stock machinations going on. Uh, yeah. yeah, I forget the name of the Canadian production company, but that was... that was. Uh, I, I guess the release title was The Funny Farm. Um, it was called Comics when we shot it, and they, they had to change... The name because for some copyright reason and then my character's name had to get changed like three times that was crazy when i first read the script the character's name was mark chapin <laughs> i said well that's fine but i don't want to play somebody named chapin and they said okay we'll change it to mark chapman and then one night we were shooting and my phone rang in the middle of the night and it was one of the actors from new york in crying hysterically and i said what's what's going on and he said john lennon got shot and i said oh my god that's horrible and Mark Chapman shot him. And I was, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, so we had to change the character's name again to Mark Champlin. So there was a lot of reshoots on that. Yeah. Yeah. Funny. I, I just talked to Derek McGrath about the movie, too. Yeah, he was great. He was wonderful. Yeah. I hope he had good things to say about it. Oh, yeah. He said it was a, it was a silly good time, you know. And... Yeah, there's some great uh, Canadian comedians in here. Howie Mandel, Peter Aykroyd, Maurice LaMarge, uh, Mike McDonald, yeah. who uh, we lost a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that, yeah. No, it's funny. You know, when I, when I met Jim Carrey on the set of Man on the Moon, yeah. I think he recognized me from that movie uh, because, you know, he's like, I don't know, five or six years younger than I am. So yeah. if I was like in my early 20s when I did that, he was like in his teens, and that was when he was like like absorbing everything like a sponge mm -hmm. and, you know, seeing every movie and, you know, paying attention to every showbiz thing. So when I met him, he put his arm around me and he pulled me in close and he whispered in my ear, fellow countrymen, because he assumed <laughs> I was Canadian and I'm not. So I had to say, okay, Andy, <laughs> no problem. I'm your fellow countryman. Yeah. He, pr he probably auditioned for the movie. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Well, I mean, that, my star was pretty high at that time. And there was also, there was a, a strike. Uh, in, in, uh, I think it was an, either an actor strike or a writer strike. So there was very little action in, uh, in L.A. at that time. And I was with Creative Artists Agency. And I said, please, I just want to go to work. And they said, well, we have this Canadian picture we're working on. Would that be interested? And I said, you bet it, I'd be interested in that. You know. Yeah, uh, I, I know the strike you're talking about because Powers Booth uh, won the Emmy for playing Jim Jones, and when he went in to uh, to accept the Emmy, he said, "This is probably the smartest move of my career, or the dumbest, <laughs> because of the strike." Yeah, <laughs> because well, you know these these strikes. I mean, there was a, there was a strike in New York, I guess L.A. too, uh, for against commercials about 15 years ago. And it, it changed the whole landscape. I mean, a lot of people just said, hey, we don't need these unions. And a lot of young actors said, well, why should I join a, join a union anyway? And people would say, well, you know, screw it. We don't need to shoot our commercials in the United States. We'll go to South Africa. You know, all we need is like a shot of a car driving through a landscape. We'll put in a voiceover later. You know, and so that kind of a lot of work just, you know, because that was, that was the heartbeat. I mean, you used to be able to be a working actor. Yeah. These days... You can't be, there are no working actors. I mean, the working actors are 
stars, basically, you know. And yeah. even them, they're just living paycheck to paycheck, job to job, you know. And people are creating their own content on YouTube, which I think is great. I think that's a great way to put yourself sure. out there, you know, if you have spare time and you're not auditioning, especially now with quarantine going on. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But also it makes anybody with a cell phone think that they could be a movie star. Oh, and, you know, it's great. Yeah. And the really good ones make it look really easy, but, you know, there, there is a technique to it. There is, there is you know, something. They, they don't know a... a <laughs> Objectivity. They don't know that at all. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a, I, I make my living these days as a real estate broker. Right. That's another. That's another uh, industry that technology is trying to, you know, disrupt. And it's like I had a long interview this morning with a local real estate publication, and you know, we're constantly trying to uh, redefine our what they call value proposition. It's like, why should you hire me when you can, you know, go online and look at apartments? Well, you'll find out what it is, you know, what I what I have to offer. And it's the same thing. If you think you can cast your movie with a bunch of people that have never been to a movie, be my guest. Go right ahead. You know, but there's certain things like, especially if you're going to edit it, if you're going to cover a scene, you know, that there's, there's, there is a technique. Film acting is highly technical. And if, if you have technique and no talent, you can get away with it. I mean, there's plenty of actors that, you know, have gotten careers on that that really don't have any chops at all, but they're, they're really good. They know how to find the light, what angle works for them, how to be blank enough that the audience can kind of project what they want on them. You know, I'm not, I'm not that kind of actor. I'm much more... Uh, outgoing. I'm much more stage trained. You know what I do is got to kind of, you know, it's got to get up to the balcony sometimes. You know, it's, it's uh, sometimes it's too big or it's too busy or it's too f manic or frantic. But uh, you know, it's it's it is what it is. Absolutely. So uh, uh, you mentioned before, get crazy. Was that o overall a good experience? One of the best. Mm -hmm. One of the best. I mean, it was such a playful workplace. And it was so much fun. And Alan Arkish, you know, I mean, a movie set, it, 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 it's, it's like a pyramid. And the, the tense, I mean, the, 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 the tone on the set of the movie, mm -hmm. down to the bottom, you know, the craft service people and the teamsters is set by the top of the pyramid. And that's the producer and the director. And if those guys are mellow and fun, you're going to have a good time. And, you know, Alan Arkish is just one of, one of the great guys. He's, he's, you know, he's such a fan. He just loves music and he loves pop culture. And so he's always, you can talk about anything with him. And he loves food and he loves to cook. And his wife is a terrific cook, you know. And so that was another one of those experiences where it's like, oh, who am I going to work with today? Fabian yeah. and Bobby Sherman. <laughs> Far out. Hi guys, you know, what are we gonna do in this scene? Why don't we try this? You know? And it was it was just it was just great. I mean that kind of playful energy. I mean I think I think that that's the kind of directors I've worked for. That's the kind of people maybe that are attracted to working with me because I really like people. And it's like, what do you want? What can I do for you? You know, how do you want this set to work? You know, I mean, Mila Schwarman is like that. I mean, it's it's he's very improvisatory. Um, he shoots if he can with multiple cameras. Um, but if you have some brilliant ad lib that he want to have in there, you got to know that it's got to be on camera and it's got to be mic'd. And if you're going to cover the scene, you've got to be able to say, listen, I think I've got something to say. You know, why don't you, you know, put a mic on me here, you know? And it's just, it's just that freedom. That's what, that's what an actor wants from a director is the freedom within the confines set by the script and, and the scene and the day and the director, the freedom to fill in that box as completely as possible. Mm -hmm. And maybe even suggest things outside that box that maybe will inspire the director to do something. I mean, you're familiar with Pandemonium? Oh, yes. Okay, so you remember the scene where we're playing strip poker and the camera's like zipping around? <laughs> yes. We made that up. Yeah. We made that up. And we were like talking that morning, okay, we're going to shoot the card game scene. And we just started riffing on the candy, sandy, randy, mandy, you know, like this. And, and, and then the director was like, oh, he was like in the middle of us, like spinning around listening to this. And he goes, oh my God, I just had an idea. What if we did it and we put the camera in the middle and spun around? And we're all like, yes, <laughs> yes, do that. <laughs> and it was just like, that's how it gets done. But you have to have the sense not to say your line till the camera's on you or else the take doesn't work because you can't cut away from something like that. You've got to know what you're doing. 
Mm-hmm. I, I haven't seen the, I haven't seen Get Crazy in a long time. Did you work with um, uh, Stacy Nilkin? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, not so much one on one. I yeah. think we were in big shots together. But I've since gotten to know Stacy lives in New York, and I, I, uh, I've, I've rekindled our friendship. In fact, I did a screening of Get Crazy a couple of years ago yeah. to benefit uh, the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. I'm a supporter of this group, and because of the whole, you know, Fillmore East and the history, uh, we did a screening at the Film Forum. Uh, on, and, no, Anthology Film Archives, that's where it was. And, uh, and, and we had a panel discussion afterwards, and Stacy graciously came and joined that panel. It was great. It was yeah, she's one of my favorite guests I've ever had. She, she could have been a man in another life. She's got such a mouth on her, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's a, she's a character, all right. Well, also, you got to understand, those of us that are of that age, mm-hmm. that went through this crucible together, it forges a bond. You know, like when I go to one of these, because the way I ran into Stacy was one of these fan conventions, and like you see each other across the room, and you just start running, and you start hugging. You yeah. know, Trini Alvarado was another person like that. I see Trini at these things. You know, I never worked with Trini, but, you know, growing up, we're sort of the same age. I was aware of her work. She was aware of my work. It's like, yes, and it's just, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like being in war together or something, you know? It's a real yeah. bonding exercise. A couple other people I've interviewed from it, uh, Barry Diamond, a uh, very funny stand-up comedian. Uh, sure, I know. Barry was in Get Crazy. Yeah. And, uh, Jackie Joseph, great lady. She's been so sure. much stuff since the 50s. Yeah. So, um, yeah, with, with Howard the Duck, I mean, it, it's starting to, to get accepted because people are now aware that, that it was a Marvel comic book. I don't think people knew it back then, you know. Um, you, yeah. you had worked with Willard Hike on um, on French postcards, right? Correct, and Gloria Katz, his wife, who just died last year. Yeah. Oh my God, I I, I couldn't believe that. Yeah, I mean they were a team. You know, they they worked together with George Lucas on American Graffiti, going that far back. Right. Well, they went to film school together. Uh, although I think Gloria might have gone to USC, and Willard went to UCLA, and that their cohort was like you know. Francis Coppola and George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, you know, so it was that, that crowd. And, um, you know, that's, that was, that was, as that group rose, their star rose. And we had done French postcards and we'd become friends and, and Willard still is a friend. In fact, I owe him an email. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, they called me and they said, we need you to come work on this. And I, I was doing a play uh, with Isabella Rossellini at the time, oh. Summerstock. And I said, well, I, I, I can't get out there what what do you want me to do? And they said, we don't know. Just get out here fast. So I went out in, in like August, and they needed help wrangling all the all the, the duck people, you know. And they said they basically look around and and you know just get a sense of, of what's going on. I mean, first they called me like six months earlier and they wanted me to help cast Howard the Duck, and I was just like I. I I just couldn't. I mean, I'm not a casting person because they, they needed dwarves to fit inside a radio-controlled suit. Ed, so yeah. when I got there, they had like three dwarves and special effects people and makeup people and puppeteers and all these people, but nobody was like acting Howard. Nobody was being the duck. Everybody was, was looking at a little part of it and nobody was caring about the character. You know, and that, that the... the, the the thing about that movie that's that's really difficult is that character is the, he's the star. I mean, he's in every scene. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he has all the funny lines. And you know, it's not like E.T. where E.T. didn't say anything. You know, and E.T. You know, a light bulb goes on in his chest and you start crying. You know, Howard was like smoking cigars and sleeping with girls and stuff. So we had all these pieces that had to get together to make this character. So that's why I worked on the set like every day, first and second unit, and that's why I have a a, a, um, a credit as the duck coach. You know. Mm-hmm. I've talked. Talk, I've talked to Ed about it and stuff. And oh, you talked to Ed Gale? Yeah. Ed Gale saved saved our butts in that movie. I can you can quote me on that. <laughs> Ed Gale, remarkable, remarkable guy. Ed and I got to be quite quite intimate on that movie. <laughs> Mm-hmm, that's good. Yeah. We're, 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 did, did, was this shot in San Francisco? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm Basically bo- all over the Bay Area. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm born and raised in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, earlier in the movie, there that they were in in Ohio um, shooting uh, the the exteriors, and uh, a lot of people think that it's purely an Ohio movie. And I say no. A lot of it's shot in my hometown. <laughs> No, the whole thing was shot. Even the scenes in Ohio were shot in San Francisco. Really? <laughs> yes. Wow. I, I didn't realize that. Good. <laughs> yeah, Leah Thompson, uh, she was like one of the first people I ever met at a Comic-Con. She's an absolute sweetheart. and uh, She sure is. Yeah. She owns Real the... professional, too. Real pro. Yeah, and she owns the fact that she tried to uh, seduce Howard. She's not embarrassed by that at all. <laughs> Yeah, did it feel silly at all witnessing that? Uh, we all knew what we were doing. I mean, come on. And we had the <laughs> erection feathers on the top of the head. You know, that was the, that was the gag, you know. Is this the shot where we need the, the gag to work, the feathers to come up? Yes, it is. Okay, get the special head with the erection feathers, you know. <laughs> I noticed well, when you guys are, are at the lab, David Pamer uh, was there. Oh, I love David. What a, what a pro he is. No, what happened yeah. was that um, uh, there was another actor who was supposed to play the role that I played, and he dropped out. And um, so Gloria just sort of said, oh, well, you can, you can do that role. You, you take that over and do that. And I said, well, if I do that, who's going to do what I do on the set with the duck? And she said, oh, anybody can do that. And I said, oh, really? Oh, okay, <laughs> let's do that. And of course, you know. It, it, you, you had to learn, but it was tricky because Ed couldn't see out of that suit, you know, and, and yeah. there were big physical limitations. I mean, the only thing where he could see out of it was if the mouth was open and his head was looking down. So if, you know, in the mornings, Willard would say, okay, here's the shot. I want Howard to come out that door and run down this staircase. And I'd have to say, Willard, he can't run down the staircase. I can give you a a fast walk, but his head's going to be down because he has to see where his feet are going and he's wearing these duck feet. So it's, you know, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. You know, so when, when, you know, and I, and I had a little thing, you know, Ed had a little earwig. So I was sort of telling him, I'm not telling him what to do, but like if there was a cue or something, I would say, okay, and you know, if he's walking down a flight of stairs, I would say, and stop, you know, or last step now, like this, you know, and we had this, we had this rhythm worked out among me and Ed and the puppeteer who was operating the mouth, you know, I mean, what I did with those guys was I showed them episodes of um, the Honeymooners, because I said, look, this is what we need, Ralph Cramden is Howard the Duck. I mean, look at how big this character is. Look how, you know, his arms flail around and his gestures. You know, pow, zoom, Alice, right to the moon. I said, this is Howard the Duck. So I, I said, I want like an hour with all the makeup people and all the, all the special effects people and the puppeteers and all the dwarves. Please, I want, you know, I just, I, I want to show them old Honeymooners episodes. They said, are you crazy? And I said, yeah, I'm crazy, but we need to build a team here. We need to be on the same page about who this guy is, who this character is, because if this character doesn't work, your movie's not going to work. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, because if you do that movie today, you do it with special effects, but Industrial Light and Magic was doing, the, I believe, the first CGI in a major Hollywood picture while we were there, right. which was the stained glass from young Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. And we were there for like nine months, and it was nine months of, of computer work to try to render that sword fight in uh, young Sherlock Holmes, where the stained glass comes to life and starts dueling swords with Sherlock Holmes. You know? Oh, they were they, both movies were being shot simultaneously? Well, no, what happens is that people would farm out their special effects to industrial light and magic. So they would do the effect shots for young Sherlock Holmes. I mean, I think they shot that, you know, on location in London. But for the, the, the special effects, they used industrial light and magic. But we shot uh, Howard the Duck. That was our production, was headquartered at Industrial Light and Magic at ILM in San Rafael. So mm -hmm. that's where we had our production offices, and, you know, studio space and things like that. I see. So, so what made you, what made you go into realty? Did it get to a point where roles started drying up, and you you figured you needed a much more stable income? Well, I mean that was a fact. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not independently wealthy, but that was a fact. Uh, and I went and I took a, a a course, one of those kind of 
midlife crisis courses that you could take about, you know, you need a change of career? Come and oh, take yeah. the course. We'll figure it out. And I took, I took the Myers-Briggs uh, test. And it's a famous psychological profile test. And uh, you answer a lot of questions. And then you compute a lot of numbers. And then you look up in this book for what your ideal profession should be. And I don't remember all the professions it said I should do, but I do remember one of them was horse exerciser. You know, the guy who, like, walks a horse in a circle after a race. Uh, and I thought, no, that's really not my bag. And yeah. then another one was bonsai horticulturalist. You know, a guy who makes bonsai, little miniature Japanese trees. Right. And I just kind of I just kind of laughed and I said, no, I'll get a real estate license. <laughs> the hours are more or less flexible, and, you know. And then, but then I was a single parent. I had two kids. My wife left and, you know, I had, I had a lot of bills to pay and two kids to raise. So I, I, my time was precious. So, um, and then the ironic thing was, you know, in, in real estate, much like the entertainment career, you, you kind of get out of it what you put into it. Mm. So when I started getting traction with real estate, I had to just do more because it was like to do a good job, you've got to be present. You, you've got to, you know, you've got to be there. You've got to do it. And then you've got to take advantage of every situation that comes along. So, you know, I don't know. And part of me is waiting for the phone to ring so I can give this up and go back to making movies. But I don't think that's going to happen. And that's fine if it doesn't, you know. Yeah. Did, did you also get sick of auditioning? I hate auditioning. Absolutely yeah. hate it. Hate it, hate it, hate it. And now everything is, is like self-taping, yeah. which, which we used to do a little bit. But there's no interaction. I mean, that kind of thing I was talking to you about earlier with, with directors and the trust that develops and the bonds and the, what, the process on the set. You, you, when you're cast via a, a, a self-tape, wh where does that come in? You know, but if you're doing effects pictures and green screen stuff, it doesn't matter because it's basically, you know, look up at, at the tennis ball on the C stand and scream as if, you know, there was a comet coming to hit your earth, you know. It's just, it's not the same. Yeah, I know everybody I talk to says that they don't like um, doing, they don't like doing the, the Zoom auditions and all that stuff. No. Well, actually, I've never done a Zoom audition. I hear they're, they're kind of nerve-wracking, but, but kind of similar. No, I love meetings because I like people and I like talking to people, but auditions and stuff. You know, because either, I mean, for me, it was always like I got to do a little bit of work or I got to do a lot of work. You know, because either I'm going to go on my guts and my you know, my instincts, or I'm going to really drill down on this and really learn this, which might be completely different than what the director wants. But what I always liked in auditions is when the director would say, I really like what you're doing, try this, and then you try that, and then they get to see that, you know, that you're flexible and you like to work with them, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is business slow during uh, quarantine? Which business? Realty. Uh, it has been, but it's, it's just in the last month. It's come back with a boom in New York. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm very busy right now, so yeah. Good. Touch wood. You know, you didn't uh, didn't take a tumble or anything because I heard it's pretty bad over there in New York uh, concerning deaths and all that. It's pretty bad. We were ground zero, yeah, at the beginning. Um, but we're you know we're New Yorkers. We can we can face it, and uh, we have a governor who's you know pretty. Strong, mm -hmm. so he clapped down. Um, but the trouble is, a lot of the uh, the tourist industry was was gone, yeah. and then a lot of the cultural things that brought the tourists in, they were gone. Broadway, museums, and then of course, like the lower paying jobs, the hospitality jobs, you know, they went. You know, and the actors who would like wait tables at night, they all went home. You know, so it's 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 very tricky, but. And palpably, especially last weekend, I really felt it strongly. People are just dying to get back to to life, you know, and, and culture and mixing it up and going to restaurants and, you know, going to bars and, you know, going to nightclubs and hearing live music and going to the theater, you know. And it'll come back. It'll come back. I hope so, yeah. I mean, I have my days where I'm skeptical and then I have my days where I'm positive because just every day you know, you're finding out something new in the news about something that's just absolutely terrifying. Yeah, well, welcome to life, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It just After 9-11 happened, I mean, the whole world just went crazy, I feel like. It got weirder and weirder, you know? It has. No, you're absolutely right. 
I mean, it's 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 just it's phenomenal. I mean, I, I have a, I have two kids. One is 22 years old, and he lives with me. We're quarantined together, and I've got a daughter who's 26, mm-hmm. and she lives as a works for a, a family upstate as a, a nanny. And you know, it's really hard. I mean, we watch the news, and it's really hard to, to talk to these guys and sort of explain what's going on, and to, you know, to be on the same page because they. I mean, they grew up. This is what they know. My son graduated from college last June, but the mm-hmm. last five months of his college life, he never left his house. Every class, including gym, was online. You know, this is yeah. college years. This is what the Whiffenpoofs at Yale sing about. You know, this is supposed to be like the greatest time of your life. Yeah. He's, you know, stuck up in upstate New York in a cold, drafty, you know, filthy apartment with a bunch of people, you know, knee-deep in take-out pizza boxes, you know. <laughs> I guess at the end of the day, it's character building, and that's all that matters. Uh, well, my son's got a pretty good character, so yeah. That's good. Well, Miles, I thank you so much for coming on today. This has been great. My pleasure. My pleasure. So do you edit these, or you just sort of put it up on a podcast? I put it on my podcast, yeah. I don't really edit anymore. Our, our editing studio on YouTube is terrible now. I was hoping by now there'd be an outcry to fix it. Hopefully there will be. Who knows? Well, I hope I didn't curse too much or say anything I wasn't supposed to. And oh, there's enjoy it. oh, oh, there's there's a lot of podcasts out there with me saying lots of vulgar stuff, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, very yeah. good. Because I can curse like a sailor if I need to, but I try to hold it back. That's why you and Stacy get along. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thanks a lot. My pleasure, Ed. Please stay safe. Very good. You too. All right. Okay. Now. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Miles Chapin. Ain't he a cool dude? What a nice guy, huh? And I'm glad that uh, he's happy in his realty life. But he left. he's left behind some great cult classics. Who knows? Maybe someone will hire him again in the future for more. Especially in the Marvel Universe. Because the remake of Howard the Duck will happen. I am confident it will. And it will be better than the original. Nah. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.